Hello, I'm Robin and welcome to Molten Music Technology. Now it appears that against all better judgment, I might have purchased a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. <laughs> a tape machine, an open reel machine. Something that takes this sort of thing. Is that exciting? I don't know. It's rash, that's what it is, it's rash. But I thought I might make a video just sort of outlining my thinking around this subject because it's it's vast and interesting. I mean, there's there's no end to the thoughts and avenues you can go down when talking about analog tape, when talking about recording. And the depth of my knowledge is weeny. I have no idea what I'm doing, and that's what makes it so exciting. Because if you know me at all, you know that I like to kind of just jump in with with both feet with no water wings and just flap around <laughs> having a go at stuff. I'm a having a go at stuff kind of kind of guy, which involves a lot of risk, a lot of failure, but also a heck of a load of fun along the way. So I, I don't have it yet. I have, I've pulled the trigger. I've purchased it and I go and pick it up tomorrow from Peterborough on my motorbike, which presents its own challenges, I can tell you. So before I get to the point of actually making it work, assuming that it does work, playing something back like this thing here. This happens to be a, a spool of seven inch reel that I have and it's from the Galaxy Electric. It was part of their Kickstarter campaign. I thought, what the heck? You never know, one day I might actually own a reel to reel recorder, machine player thing, and so it might be useful. And I thought it was a brilliant thing and a beautiful thing to have, and it is. And so I'm really excited about the idea that tomorrow I should be able to actually listen to the music on it. That's very exciting, very exciting. But why, I hear you say, why? Why would you go out there and buy an old tape machine? I mean, what possible, possible thing has overtaken your brain that you would think that that's a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm sure I have really good reasons, but it also raises a lot of questions, like do I have a vintage fetish, for instance? Is it some deep, need to look devastatingly cool and hipster in my videos. I, I, I mean, I, I expect so. Is it the romance of tape? Is it the sound? Or is it just simply because I enjoy the fuss and frustration of, of maintenance and messing about with bits of old technology that I have no idea and no business dealing with? I mean, I think it's all of those things. Yeah, I've got good reasons, I've got bad reasons, I've got complete flights of fancy. I have this extraordinarily romantic and naive idea that it's going to revolutionise my music making, my music recording, the capturing of performance. It's going to, it's going to nail that down and allow me to produce these awesome sounded, thick and gooey electronic masterpieces. I mean, that, that's what's in here. That's what's in here, along with a lot of Pulp Fiction and a lot of other people's Insta Instagram stories where it just looks flipping cool. And I love the idea of it. I do. But I might be doing this completely wrong. I mean, there's no way that I have the knowledge or the experience to look after, to maintain, to readjust, realign, demagnetize. I don't know, these are all new terms that I'm having to come to grips with. I don't have any of those skills. Could I acquire them? Possibly. Well, we shall see. And perhaps there's very little chance of this revolving tape thing actually meeting any of my fanciful expectations. But it, it might. <laughs> it might. So why would I put myself through this? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be expensive and ridiculous, isn't it? Well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. So... Let me share my thought processes then. Let's start at the beginning. So many, many years ago, I had a Fostex X28 four track cassette tape recorder. It was fantastic. It was such a huge leap from the tape to tape, double tape deck overdubbing that I've been doing up to that point. And suddenly I had my own flipping studio in my bed sit with my guitar. <laughs> and I was able to, to make music and lay down tracks. It was fantastic. Now, there was nothing about the sound of that that I ever considered as useful, good, fabulous, interesting. It just was what it was. I mean, it was noisy and it would wobble a little bit and you would get bleed through and I'd put the tape in backwards and find myself recording myself over the top of myself. 
sometimes. It was fragile, get chewed up. You'd tread on them or break them or it would just snap. There were all these sorts of physical elements to it that were just accepted because that's what it was. It was physical. It's what it was and it did what it did. And you accepted it for that and made music. Brilliant music. Well, you know, kind of. Brilliant because in the sense that you just had to do it. You had to lay down a track and you had to practice until you got that track right and then lay it down. And then it was down. There's no fiddling about after the event. But then some fool gave me a piece of digital multi-track software for my computer back in the 90s and everything changed everything the moment that I was able to copy and paste a piece of guitar on an arrange window that was it that was it my x28 then just became for a little while it became the input stage for my sound blaster card and then as soon as I got myself a decent audio interface which was the M Audio Delta 44 with the Omni IO breakout box it was gone I, I, I sold it I think or threw it away or, or something I mean it was already a little bit broken you know bits of the PCB and the connectors on the back had started being less than reliable such as the way with hardware and so I dove headfirst into computer based recording and stayed there for 20 years I think I mean doors audio digital audio just fantastic just the the power that that gives the musician in their ability to generate and create and craft songs tracks sounds whatever you like it's just it's just phenomenal and remains phenomenal and so what changed why am I no longer a champion perhaps of the computer format well I don't know I think I changed I think the things I value has changed and that has consequently changed the way that I make music you know ever since I spilt out of the box as it were I found myself more creative more intrigued more fascinated uh, by music by by live performance I've fallen back in love with the idea of performing music rather than crafting sculpting sound you know I love using I love using my hands my my ears my body my whole interaction with something which is tactile and feelable you can't get that from a mouse you cannot feel cables and signals and electricity through a mouse and a screen it's not there and so it is through discovering this kind of experience that I found myself at my most creative ever in my entire life perhaps with the exception of the time I had that four track cassette and a guitar and I'd borrowed a drum machine <laughs> perhaps then then I was massively creative churning out stuff all the time making making music and that's what I do now. And I've had this gap, this gap of computerized um, you know, music making, which is brilliant. I mean, it is awesome. I can create an entire cinematic soundtrack or record a band or fiddle around with synths. It's everything. I can do everything on the computer. But it never or rarely resulted in very much. Whereas on this, I mean, just the other night, I did a couple of hours of live stream, which include an hour's worth of jamming. And it was just joyous and superb may not for the people listening but for me my experience of working this instrument this machine is just it's just sublime there's nothing quite like it it thrills me <laughs> which is I mean what what thrills us these days very few things and so this 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 idea of the physical world, this idea of hardware, the concepts involved in using my fingers, my hands to touch things, to turn things, to switch things, it's that which I want to pursue more and more. And so in in finding my way to real to real is an extension of trying to put the output of what I'm doing to some kind of device for capture and doing it in the same vibe and the same way that I am creating the sound in the first place. I can do that on computer. Sure, I can plug this into computer and uh, and off you go. But it's a rigmarole. There's fussing around with, with drivers. There's fussing around with software updates. There's, there's plugins. There's 
having to go over there, having to go over there and click on a mouse to make something happen. You know, I'm here, I'm doing stuff. I don't want to reduce myself down to, to a screen and a single point on a mouse in order to engage with the creativity that I'm producing. I don't want that. I want to reach out and flick a switch. The other thing with a computer is that it tempts you into multi-track. You know, I'll be routing ADAT cables over to my computer, recording eight tracks, 16 tracks, so that I can individualize and separate out sound sources. And now there's a lot of goodness in that. I mean, it's awesome to be able to do that, to drag different sound sources out and then mix them in the computer later. Balance your levels, pan stuff about, you know, post-production, work it, craft it, make it better and better. And inevitably it just knocks around languishing on a hard drive somewhere where it'll never get finished. It will be endlessly tweaked if looked at again. Now, and the other problem with multi-tracking Eurorack is that you're not hearing it like you want to hear it. Because you're sending everything out individually, you're just getting a very sort of flat mix coming back. You're not reacting to the music. You're not driving it. It's not inspiring you with the next spin of that, of that sequence. You know, you want it as it is within the machine. At least I do at this point. You know, there's arguments for everything. But what I am looking to do is to see this instrument as an instrument, as a performance, and to capture that so that... My, my panning, my mixing, my levels are all as they are within the machine and part of that performance. That's part of the adjustment and crafting of that sound and producing that music in that moment, right then. And that's what I want to capture. I don't want to go, oh, this is quite good. Hang on, go over there and turn on that. Oh no, there's an email, do that, you know, Facebook. Okay, got that, all better, Insta it. Right, okay, where was I? Don't want any of that. I want a machine sat here that I can press record on. That's what I want. And, you know, if I can do that while engaging every single emotion about vintage gear, classic ways of working, tape saturation, all of these physical protrusions into our realities that just make you feel alive. If I can wrap that up in the way that I record, then why the heck not? I would say. <laughs> but why do it on a, a clapped out old liable to break tape machine? Why not do it cleverly? Why not record within some other recording device? Yeah, I mean, that that's fair. I mean, I could get a disting, for instance. I can pull out my disting. That has a wave recorder in it. Just route my outputs through that. And it's there, right, within my Eurorack. I, if I can work out how to turn it on through the correct use of the interface, then I could be recording onto that. Yeah, that, sure. I could get a little external recorder. Lots of people use those and just hit record on that. Yes. Yeah, I could do that. But that misses something quite fundamental about the open reel tape experience. And that's... That's its presence, its physicality, the fact that it's there and it's moving. So many times I've done recordings, camera to recorder. I see I'm checking it again now just to make sure uh, over on the computer, on other bits and pieces that just have not been enabled. I haven't hit the button or not put it on correctly or it's paused or it's run out of SD card space or some other I've got a notification on the computer and it's decided to crash the audio system. You know, there's a whole number of reasons why something does not get captured when you were fully expecting everything to be so and you were totally engaged in your machine. Because you can't monitor all of these devices that you're recording to all at once. The, the tiny little LED or the tiny little record light that's flashing, you know. You've got this thing spinning over here. It's spinning around. You can see it moving. While I'm working on my machine here, the peripheral vision can see the reels go round. You can see the operation of the machine. And I don't think that should be underestimated. It's right there telling you that you're in record and it becomes part of the environment in which you're working. Romantic, did I say? Good. Lord, yes. 
<laughs> Ridiculous. Ridiculous amounts of romance involved in this whole in this whole gambit. <laughs> so will my experience of this reel to reel come anywhere close to matching my expectations? I mean it's unlikely. It's unlikely. But I don't know that that's the point. It's an experiment. It's a it's a try. It's a it's a pushing of myself into another reality to just see whether the weather's nice over there, whether it feels good. I don't know. I mean, there's one issue that that comes up a lot, and that's a question of convenience. You know, because tape is not really convenient. There's a and there's an element. I mean, on one hand, you've got the convenience of the machine being there. You know, I'm plugged, rooted through it already. I can see the big V mu meters going. I know the levels are good. Crack, crank it into record, and you're off. Brilliant. That side of it, just awesome. But then, when you get to the end of your recording, what do you do? Because you're going to have to get it onto your computer anyway. And so you have this, this. It's essentially slow technology. Because once you've finished recording, I've then got to listen to it all the way through again as I transfer it to the computer, as I record it through my audio interface. That's that's going to be there. But I'm not having to do that during my performance. I'm doing it afterwards. And then to suggest that that's inconvenient is to say that you don't actually want to listen back to your music. And I kind of think that I do. And I kind of like the idea of being forced to listen back to my music so that I can reflect upon it. I can learn from it. I can say, mm, well, yeah, you know, this worked, that didn't, that kind of thing. And you don't necessarily do that. When you capture stuff, if I'm making videos and I capture a performance, I don't tend to listen to it back. I'm editing it, editing the video down, but I'm not really listening to the sound. And so after doing a half hour performance to tape and then spending a half hour listening to it back, I think it's time well spent. And I'm happy with that level of slowness in my life if it gives me the opportunity to improve what I'm doing. So it's not about a faster workflow necessarily. It's about a less fussy one. It's about a less complicated one. It's about less frustration. It's about less computer time and more listening, more music time. With the added bonus that it might might sound awesome <laughs> because is it the sound is it about the sound y yes well it is yes to it yeah I mean yeah of course I mean as I said earlier I didn't really consider the sound of cassette when I was using cassette and I didn't really consider it in comparison to digital audio when I started using computers because I'd re I just I don't, I don't know that I care that much but these days, my computer is, is packed full of plugins that are trying to emulate the sound of tape. And I like those plugins. I enjoy adding that kind of sense of gooiness. But because I'm now dealing far more with analog than anything else in here, I mean, the, the mixer in this is just juicy. You know, as it heats up, you get this, this character that comes in. You get that with oscillators. So I've already got character and vibe going on in the machine. And I have this questionable belief that the tape machine is going to add a further layer of that. A squashiness, a juiciness, you know, a chewableness that we keep trying to find within our digital workstations. And it's gonna be there. It's gonna be it's gonna be right there, I think. <laughs> But again, I don't know, it might be awful. But then I see all these wonderfully creative people using cassettes like crazy. You know, and it's going to be at least as good as that. It has to be at least as good as that, I think. And there's there's a, there's something about that. The same as I've I, you know I've refound my love for vinyl. It's it's ridiculous. I I know you can say in the comments. I mean, how misguided and imaginary I'm being about all this. That's fine. You're welcome. But I like to live in that dream, man. I like to stay. I like to stay. I like to stay with the idea that these things are possible and extraordinary. And I want to, to pull those kinds of feelings into the reality of what I'm doing. Anyway, so I let, let's get to the practicalities then. So I've purchased an Akai 4000 DS Mark II off eBay for about 200 quid from a bloke in Peterborough. Seems nice. 
as far as I know, it's fully functional, working. It has all the bits that let you convert it from 3.75 to 7.5 inches per second. I don't, I, I don't know, really. And it has the things that keep the spools on. <laughs> I found a manual online, so, you know, how hard could it possibly be? It just has stereo recording in two directions, so you can use all four tracks on a piece of tape. And so it seems, it seems like it might do the job. But why this one? Why wasn't I looking for Revox or Tascam or other reel-to-reel machines? Why not multi-track? You know, well maybe, but these are gonna be expensive. There has to be, you have to have a budget in mind. You have to have some kind of realm of possibility, of reality in what you're gonna do. You can spend thousands and thousands on open reel machines. That's really not what I'm interested in. I'm essentially interested in a slightly more you know, hipster, flashy, extraordinary looking, cool and trendy, better version than my Foster X8 28. You know, I just want Cassette Plus in an awesome fashion. That's all I'm after, I suspect. I mean, I've been surfing on eBay for a long time looking for these sorts of things. Every now and again, I dip in and go, I, I don't really know. Is it any, I've no, I've no clue. No clue what's good. No clue what's pro, semi-pro, what's, consumer level no clue as to what would be good whether it's in good condition you know just floundering around like you usually do surfing things going i don't know anything about this but i find it fascinating and i don't know about you but i get i get very frustrated by people who post on instagram oh yeah i just picked up this this awesome 1970s revox off uh, off some charity shop somewhere for a fiver you know i mean that's never going to happen I'm not going to camp outside charity shops on the off chance that someone might drop off some kind of old tape machine that's been in a loft for 50 years and totally undisturbed. It is not going to happen. So how? How did I come upon this Akai? Well, funnily enough, it's by a post from Oz from Expert Sleepers. He's just released a, a new album of quite extraordinary, wobbly, moody, droney, atmospheric kind of stuff you should go and go and check that out i'm sure it'll be available through expert sleepers website or something of that nature but he talked about how he's got back into making tape loops which apparently was something he did in the past and uh and what he did was that he bought himself an akai 4000 ds and with that he's been making tape loops and recording to it and has thoroughly enjoyed the experience and that gave me just enough it gave me just enough to think ah oh, because you know, people talk about their their machines, and I've I've eBayed and Googled plenty of them, and never really either found them or they're just massively expensive. But this one on eBay, there was half a dozen of them, and they're all around the two hundred pound mark. And I was thinking, well, this is this is a genuine possibility. <laughs> and I trust someone like Oz. I mean, he builds beautiful digital and analog modules, and so if someone knows what he's talking about, he he would be that, you know. I completely trust his view on things of this nature. But I did do a little bit of research. You know, I found out that it's a, a reasonably decent machine. You know, no one seems to go, oh, wow, that's amazing. But similarly, people go tend to go, well, no, that sounds all right. On forums and, and other places that I, I visited and Googled and such like. I then reached out on the, the internet, on social media, and put it out there that I was thinking of buying a tape machine and whether anybody thought that was a good idea. <laughs> And mostly they said, oh, wow, well, yeah, that sounds great, but don't do it. Don't do it. I mean, it's a lovely idea, but oh, no, I mean, heck, I mean, you've got to, you know, you've got to realign the bias. You've got to do this, you know, the wear on the heads. You know, you're going to need to have some kind of in-house technician whose job is to look after all those things. You can't even get tapes for it. You use modern tapes, the whole thing catches fire, you know. It's like... <laughs> So the majority of people were kind of saying, oh, it's lovely. Oh, it's lovely. But no, no, the maintenance is a, is a nightmare. I'd never do that again. I had one, loved it, loved, loved it. Had one for years. I did. Gave me no trouble for decades. And then, uh, you know, oh, I can't believe you'd want to do that now. So, you know, I don't take a blind bit of notice, of course. I mean, <laughs> I'm not one to let people's experience or opinion to sway my fantasies good lord no but it was certainly interesting and it's definitely going to be a factor this whole maintenance maintenance thing definitely but i mean the other feeling that i had is that most of the people who were commenting were probably people who worked in studios or had studios or ran studios and from a studio running point of view where you're using a tape machine absolutely relentlessly 
then the question of maintenance and looking after it is is a big one and it's a pressure situation you know i don't have that i'm going to be using it every once in a while i've even been thinking about oh i should get a dust cover for it right so the spiders don't spend all their time inside making a mess you know i might even go that far because i just want to be able to there and i just you know click it on and off you go once in a while it's not going to have intensive use and surely surely things work to some degree without you having to constantly maintain them don't they generally sort of again my lack of experience is it's it's shining through now i did find a, an article on sound or sound website from hugh rob johns about 10 years ago writing about about <laughs> real tape machines and it's a frightening read it's a frightening read if you ever wanted to scare yourself off the whole idea then go and seek out that article because it just lists all of the things that will go wrong all the things that are wearing themselves out every day it's wearing itself out more and more and becoming more and more troublesome there's no way that you're going to be able to balance all these things or understand how to do any of that stuff without you know a degree in engineering and a, and a lot of <laughs> equipment a lot of equipment an oscilloscope and a, and a level meter and sitting there measuring stuff really is that really what we have to do i mean again i kind of feel that that perhaps that's a reflection of a working studios machine you know if you're working at the bbc and you've got to get these things right then maybe but just me fiddling around surely i mean surely our grandparents owned open reel <laughs> machines that didn't require a weekly trip to a technician that they would just put on and play or record to them surely surely that's what would happen but of course i don't know <laughs> i mean it's no wonder really that in the 1960s mission impossible that the tape machine that they would get to listen to the message would instantly explode you know one use only maybe that's how it should be i mean also in the article i discovered that the quarter inch tape the quarter track quarter inch tape that i'll be using is it's no good it's not even semi-professional it's like well well consumer like and i would be much better off using quarter inch half track which is just stereo so just two tracks of that because it can then also run at higher speeds of 15 inches per second rather than seven inches per second i thought 7.5 inches per second which is what this this fella should run at was was going to be plenty <laughs> i don't know you don't know until you know also apparently i can i can expect a signal to noise ratio of about 55 dv which is not great and a roll off above 15 kilohertz but i mean that's all right i can't hear above that anyway so i don't really give a monkeys as far as that's concerned but signal to noise is an, is definitely going to be an issue but heck uh, you know, again, I, I've got to reflect back on using cassette and what sort of levels of noise you get with that, and this is going to be comparable. Then, then probably. But ultimately, Hugh in the in the article is trying to push people towards quality broadcast and studio equipment, and that's not really what this is about. I mean, it would be lovely, but I don't have five grand to drop on this sort of thing. I don't have, you know, the ability to recondition something and keep something like that working. You know, a couple hundred quid. <laughs> that's the difference you know that's the price of a couple of a pack of plugins that is it's the price of a module so if for the price of a module i could get something which allows me to capture my performances in some kind of interesting quality then i think that's all right now hugh did actually mention the very one that i've purchased in the article saying that actually it's not bad and relatively easy to maintain but it's not going to provide you with a professional recording <laughs> but to get a mention flip an egg woohoo i'm onto the right track then i think so that that's my story i guess that's my thought process and all of this kind of brings us back to the notion that i have no idea what i'm talking about i am just babbling on like some idiot <laughs> in a in a vintage tape obsessed sweet shop going oh i think that'll be nice let's get one of them maybe maybe I'm sure in the comments you'll be able to set me straight and correct all of my misconceptions. But that'll be all right. I never listened to those anyway. All I know is that I've never believed that, that knowledge should be a barrier to experimentation. Knowledge is brilliant. Knowledge is powerful. And that's awesome. And I always applaud people with knowledge. And I always wish I had more of it. But it can... 
it can prevent you from taking risks. It can prevent you from experimenting. Because you, if you know that none of it's going to work, if you know that, oh, it's just impossible and all good sense says don't do that, then the likelihood is you're not. You're, you're not going to do that. You can sit there going, yeah, I didn't do that. I made the right decision. Well, I want to make the wrong decision. I want to at least make my decision and try it out. I mean, it may be that it just turns into something with which I make tape loops. Never made a tape loop in my life. I am, I am boggled and fascinated when you see edited tape go around a thing. How did, how did, what, how did that happen? How did they do that? You know, that the act of destruction of a razor blade on tape is phenomenal. It blows my mind, you know. And but I like the idea of having, of taking steps towards that of having a go, of experimenting and see where it takes me, of taking those risks, you know, giving myself an opportunity to learn something. So, all this is just talk, it's just talk and thoughts. But tomorrow, I'll pick the thing up on my bike, hopefully it doesn't rain, and I'll bring it back and over the next, I don't know, however I can fit in the time to do it, I'll see, I'll see what happens and I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> so this, Will shortly be continued and you'll get it all in one uh, one fantastically overlong and ponderous video of the excitement of why you shouldn't ever buy an open reel tape machine all right so exciting times i'm about to embark on my on my little journey to peterborough very exciting town very exciting things happening and to be picking up uh, the reel to reel will be sticking it in my trusty Archeria rack brute bag, which just seems perfect for the job. Assuming that I can secure it well on the back, then it's going to be completely fine. No, no problem. No problem at all. It'll be fine. made it home again <laughs> just in time to pick up the kids Whew. I hope it's all right bike did brilliantly let's just hope it wasn't shaken to bits on some of the dodgier roads we shall see right I'm back from my escapade my little trip to Peterborough which was fun it's the longest ride i've done in a little while actually it's good everything aches and hurts now but perhaps more importantly is this what a beautiful thing what a beautiful 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 thing it's beautiful I can't quite express exactly how beautiful it is. <laughs> I'm playing my Le Galaxy Electric tape. And it's perfect. It's just perfect. It all works as far as I can tell. I even came with a manual and I was able to thread this through here knowing exactly what I'm doing. It it plays stuff. I saw the guy record stuff. Nice bloke. Lovely. <laughs> Thrilled. He's got a little garage packed full of this sort of stuff. All sorts of things. And he gave me a bunch of tapes. <laughs> which have got various things. One of them's got Pet Shop Boys on. The other one's got some strange nursery rhymes. And some opera, I think, on another one. So fascinating, fascinating. But I have tape to play with, more importantly. But just this, this sheer action, turning this. How can you get so much joy out of a control? I mean, can you imagine when sort of digital controls came along and you could just tap it and it and it worked? I mean, how, what a revelation that would have been. And why on earth are we back to this situation where I want this? I want that. I want that feel. I love the way that clunks into place. It's just extraordinary. <laughs> That's 
a flipping tape machine. It is, look at it, it's a tape machine. VU meters, doing a thing VU meters are supposed to do. Good levels they've got on here. As soon as I posted a picture of it on Facebook, somebody piped up to say that, oh, you can use it as a tape delay. What you got to do is route the outputs back to the inputs again and then monitor it through the mic input or something. I don't quite remember, but there was something about it that means you can turn it into a tape echo, which is extraordinary. So <laughs> I'll definitely give that a go. And also Oz, who I talked about earlier, the reason why I bought this particular thing is because of the fact that he was using it. He popped up on Instagram to say, oh yeah, I've got one of those. I've used it for tape loops. So it's serendipitous, you could say, or, or something, but it's brilliant. I, I, am, I totally adore it. <laughs> uh, I have one weird thing is that it doesn't actually seem to turn off, although it does, or rather it turns itself back on again. I'm un unclear at this point exactly what the on-off switch does, but I'm not going to worry about that too much. I'm just going to keep doing that till it breaks. <laughs> That's just wonderful. So my plan, uh, you know, next time I get the opportunity, next time I get a little bit of space and time, I will do some recording. Recording to this, I don't know which tape is best to use. Uh, obviously not this one, but I got some other ropey ones I could try. I'm going to try recording to it and also it will be monitoring through recording to the computer at the same time just to see the difference. See what that's going to be like. You know, I mean it may well be that this purely becomes a source of tape loops and interesting weirdness. But I hope it will be more than that. I hope it will be a recording medium. That's what that's the that's the plan. That's the ultimate plan. But but we shall see. The quality may not. Who knows? May not be there. But um, fascinating. So I'm going to leave this here for now. I'm just going to enjoy turning it on and off a few more hundred times, and uh, then I'll get to work and do some experiments on it. Yeah. <laughs> Right, so what do we make of it all then? Well, I've done my first recording to here, which was a wonderful, beautiful experience. It's not difficult. You just hold in the record button and you chunk this across to record. It sort of goes through play on the way, which is a bit odd because I got a blast of pet shop boys as I was going towards making the recording and also when I was stopping it. So I don't know what to think about that. Am I doing it right? Who knows? Who knows? Setting the levels was interesting. I mean, that's something I'm going to have to play with and, until I, I get more experienced at doing it. But the manual suggested that you get it in the high yellows. The high yellows is where you want to be. So that's kind of what I aimed for. Um, that the level set on both sides separately and then that going monitoring directly out into my computer over there where I captured the performance going through the machine. So you could say that the, the capture on the computer benefits from at least routing through the analog circuitry within this machine. So there's that. I I did. I wasn't affected at all by the the noise of the machine turning around because I'm not recording through microphones or anything like that. I'm just jamming on here, and it made absolutely no difference to me whatsoever. So the the process, uh, you know, plugging it in, rooting it over there, is easy. It's simple. I can, you know, I've not added any complexity to my setup uh, as it is. You know, I I can already do this, and I already record on the computer, and so recording to both is is absolutely no no bother at all but what I guess I'm trying to get to is a point where I can just come in plug this in turn that on and, and record but I'm not there yet because I'm still experimenting damn it I'm still trying to work these things out <laughs> I want to understand what the equalizer thing here does I mean it 
listening to it back it just seems to take more of the top end away should i use it on low noise or wide range i put it on wide range because my assumption is that when you put in noise reduction it just tends to deaden everything that was my experience of something like the x28 when using a four track cassette you put on the dolby and just all of the sparkle <laughs> disappeared so i preferred the tape hiss over the dulling down of that sound so what does it sound like well uh, here's a couple of minutes of it. I'm going to swap from uh, direct recording to tape recording to to see to see what you think about that. And I'll also point out what it looks like on screen. So have a listen, see what you think. I'll point out a couple of things on the screen, then we'll come back and round this all up with some choice bits of wisdom, which are no doubt knocking around in the back of my head that I haven't quite found yet. So here's a plot twist for you. So I'm, I'm lining the audio up. I've done the deed. I've recorded. I've now recorded my recording and set it alongside the audio that I've captured directly into the computer. And I've added the two cameras in as well. And I'm lining them up manually, which is kind of how I do things, I think. So if we zoom in here, I've got camera, camera, then direct audio, then tape audio. You can see that it's it's lined up beautifully, lined up beautifully, all ready to go, all in sync, perfect, perfect, nicely done, good job. But then, when if I if I go along a little bit further to another part of the audio, you can see that the tape's got ahead a little bit. Got a little bit ahead. Here's the three digital sources, and they are all perfectly aligned. Tape one, not so much. And then if we head towards the end of the track, so it finishes. <laughs> What's that? So 59, 602, three seconds in front. <laughs> So it finishes a couple of seconds in front, which is interesting. So when it comes to resyncing the audio recorded off the tape back onto the computer to the film, that's it's going to be out. I mean, not by much. And who's going to notice, really? But it is it is a factor. And I might have to think about how do I how do I make adjustments to do that? I mean, I can stretch the audio potentially a little bit. Um, which of course produces artifacts potentially, or I can uh, speed up the video by a few frames, that's also possible. Or I could just completely ignore it, which is probably more likely <laughs> at this point. But the other interesting thing now that we're looking at this is if we look at the two audio tracks, have them about the same size. They, you can see that they're different. I've recorded at the same level, so the same level was monitoring through the tape machine into here, into this track. And then I played it back without adjusting anything, not that there's any volume control on the tape machine. 
and recorded it at the same level and you can see that it's it's chunkier is that just volume is that just level or is there something else going on you know what's the content like is there more of it is there more juiciness does this indicate awesomeness or is it just the physics of sound and loudness i don't know interesting isn't it <laughs> so i'm going to finish editing this down to give you the opportunity to hear both sides and i will pass you back to myself over there who will talk about what we think this all sounds like so there you have it two recordings direct to computer and then the roll off back from tape it's interesting the noise is certainly there you, you can hear the noise but otherwise the differences are not are not huge at least to my ears you know it's not as if they're radically different as if the tape one is warbling and stretched and distorted somehow it's not it's nice it's fat it's chunky yeah it's hissy but it's also bright sparkly alive somehow when swapping to the direct recording it seems duller deader in some ways very interesting i mean obviously i'm going to play around with the settings a bit until i get it to be oh, i don't know i'll just keep fiddling with it until it breaks i guess that's that's the thing will i ever come to a position where i know exactly what this should be on i don't know i'll just settle on something i'm <laughs> i imagine <laughs> I don't want to spend the rest of my life analysing. I just want to record and enjoy the music. And, and I have. I mean, I've now listened back to this piece that I did on here, improvised, uh, several times now. And that's been great. I mean, there were things that went wrong. There was a bit where the, uh, the surface, the, the, the string pluck was too much, you know. Uh, but the whole point, the whole purpose of this is to do one take recordings, is to perform, is to play with this, record it, and then stick it up into the world. <laughs> That's the plan. Uh, I've cracked onto a way of solving the sync problem, which is that if when I'm using two cameras, you know, as I've gone to one camera, I can then just sort of adjust the camera up a little bit when it gets to the next one, just so that it stays, so the flashing lights and the kick drum and things like that all stay together. You know, I can manually do a little bit of tweaking there, which isn't going to be too hard, just to keep the magic together. But it is interesting that it plays back just slightly faster than it recorded. I suppose. Is that, what, is that what's actually happening? <laughs> I don't know. But, I mean, to summarise, to stop me talking, as I can just talk about this forever, but to shut me up, the, the best way I can describe this experiment is as a complete and utter resounding success. I am giddy with the awesomeness of what's occurred. The fact that I now have a functional Akai 4000 DS, for what that's worth, that I have tape I can record to, sorry about the Pet Shop Boys, <laughs> that I've recorded over, and that it sounds good. It doesn't sound fabulous, perhaps. It sounds good. Hissy, meaty, there's definitely something there. And the fact that I can turn this on and listen to it back is just gorgeous. I love it. Absolutely love it. This has been so worth it. And if you're going to try this out, I would heartily recommend doing it. Now, as soon as I start posting about this on social media, I've had people telling me, oh, you need to demagnetize. Oh, you need to do this. Oh, have fun with that, mate. <laughs> it's like, what, what, what? <laughs> Probably. I don't know. Do I? Who knows? Who knows? I always love the advice. <laughs> but... I, I, you know, I've just started something. My first go, I'll oh, do this, do that, do that. Just give us a chance. I'm sure things like demagnetization will come into it at some point, whatever it is that that's all about. All I know is I've got some kind of pokey thing that looks like the sort of thing you might flush yourself out with, and I've got to bring it in really slowly. I don't know. I will find these things out. So there you go. My experimentation with Open Reel. Yeah, it's just brilliant. <laughs> I could not be happier. Absolutely love it. I don't know if I dare do anything to do with tape looping or other weird bits and pieces. I'm just gonna, just gonna love it as a thing that I record to. Am I gonna have to get a load more tape? Am I gonna keep the tapes of stuff that I did? I don't even know how much time of recording I've got on here. I mean, this is about 15 minutes, I think, and it's, it's nearly halfway through the tape. 
so many things to learn. Will I just record straight over the top again? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, I will leave it there before I just run on and incessantly about the whole experience. But I hope that was interesting. I hope that's, that's helped other people looking into this thing as to whether the whole idea is worth it. Definitely worth it. Definitely. I mean, look at it. Look at it. How beautiful is that? Just. Just extraordinary. Just. Absolutely extraordinary. So, with that note, <laughs> please do all the things. Subscribe, Patreon, throw me some quid, give me your money, all that kind of thing, so that I can buy tape or send me tape. That would be cool. Send me tape. Yeah. Get in touch. And in the meantime, go make some tunes. <laughs>